Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar on shaping our intercultural competencies during time of crisis. My name is Kimberly Jean Farin, Community Engagement Manager at CBIE, and I will be your facilitator today. To begin this presentation, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. So we thought it was really important to have uh, an international student's perspective during this webinar. Um, so we have on the line an international student from uh, currently studying in Toronto that will um, share his experience dealing with the coronavirus outbreak. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, I am a second year master's student at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Um, like, like many of you, I have been following the news on the coronavirus quite closely because my, my home province is right, right next to Hubei, uh, the epic center of the outbreak. And even though I have not had any bad experiences in the wake of the coronavirus, the, the, the recent coverage of the discrimination against the Chinese expat community in China in, in Canada does sort of hit home for me. Uh, and that's because since moving to Canada in the summer of 2018, I've actually had a lot of moments of identity crisis as a Chinese citizen living here in, in North America. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my, my background. Before moving to Toronto, I, I worked as a journalist in China for about seven years. I, I'm no longer a journalist, but interesting, interestingly, my, my transition back to the student life here in Toronto kind of coincided with some of the biggest news stories of, of our time. There is, of course, the Huawei um, dispute that, that plunged Canada and China relations to a new low, and then came the coronavirus at the start of, of the new year. I, I, I sort of feel like there is this big global backlash against, you know, the Chinese model and the Chinese way of governance. And, 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 and sometimes the Chinese nationals are kind of caught in the crossfire. Um, I, I, I sometimes tell people that I feel like a double dissident. And the reason why I say that is because back home in China, I was sometimes viewed with suspicion because by my own government because of, of, of my journalistic role. And now that I've left China and I'm living in Canada right now, I, I, I don't quite fully feel that I, I fully belong here because as an international student, it is my Chinese identity that, that sort of stands out. And, and sometimes it feels really strange to live, to live in a time when, when even the mere mention of Chinese and China would kind of induce fear and, and, and trepidation. Um, so I, I know we're here to talk about a coronavirus, the reaction to it, uh, but I think the issue really where we're trying to get at really goes far beyond that. And, and if history is any guide, there, there will be other crises involving minority groups. So I would say the first thing I, I'd urge people to do is, is that when a crisis hits, Try, um, try to put yourself in the shoe of the other person at the center of the crisis. Just um, imagine how you would feel, say, if you were a Muslim, you know, right after the 9-11 attacks, or for that matter, what life would be like for you if you were a Japanese living in Canada after the defeat of Japan during the Second World War. So, so really, I think to combat misinformation and, and, and prejudice, it, it, it's really important for us to have a mindset that says that just because something bad or negative happened to a minority group does not mean that the whole group uh, should take the blame. And another problem that I really quickly what I want to highlight is, is, is that unfortunately, I, I think we live in a very divided society where people constantly kind of talk past each other. And I think, you know, the first step towards cultivating intercultural communication skills is, is really to communicate first, you know, and I feel like sometimes it's really hard to do that because Canadians are in general very conflict avoidant and, and maybe would not choose to, to engage, you know, if they see a different opinion. And I've had one classmate actually say to me once that, that he doesn't, 
discuss politics a lot with his friends because he he thinks doing so might might hurt his friendships in school. Um, while while I understand where he's coming from, you know, I, I I do think doing so also kind of shuts the door of of communication and dialogue. And maybe we can start, you know. Um, this by having a conversation first about our differences, um, because there, there, there's no way that we could heal the divide and tackle, you know, misinformation if we're if we're not willing to have a conversation about our differences. Now, lastly, when when it comes to the, the coronaviruses, I, I get it that people, you know, are nervous. So am I, you know, and I. But I think we can't. We we cannot let fear dictate our behavior. For example, I think it's totally okay to ask a classmate or a friend if she or he has ever been to the affected areas in in China. But it's not. It's not okay to assume every Chinese person will carry the disease and should be kind of. You know, quarantined, and I must say that not a single day goes by with without me thinking about the coronavirus situation back in China. And my heart really goes out to the victims and the affected people back home. Uh, I I I ask I really ask for your sympathy, and I do hope that my country will will、uh, pull through this crisis soon. Uh, to to conclude my remarks,、uh, I'd like to say that I'd like to quote a friend who's from Wuhan, the city where the virus originated. She wrote a Facebook post that that went viral、uh, last week, and I and I really want to read it to you. So so she wrote,、um, I understand and support the physical measures that airlines, governments, and institutions choose to put in place for for control and prevention. But at the same time, I wish to invite you all not to build up walls between our hearts.、Uh, your support will empower us, and that's the first step towards、um, our collective healing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. An international student's perspective is very important、uh, during this conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. I know we have to go back to class, but thank、yeah. you very much for taking the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye. Today's webinar will be presented by Lionel Larache. Over the past 15 years, he has provided cross-cultural training, coaching, and consulting services to over 20,000 people through a wide range of businesses, government, academic, professional, and non-for-profit organization, and 20 countries. All right. So we're going to talk. As Owen said, I mean, when situations like these bones, they will happen again. That's for sure. So, what kind of situations are we talking about? <laughs> Fundamentally, I want to look at what happens when we have one of these epidemics or pandemics, because those usually, well, originate from somewhere, some group, and that group may end up being stigmatized. So I'll take a few examples to kind of illustrate the points we're going to discuss. And well, obviously, the current epidemics of、uh, coronavirus. But we'll look also at SARS. I'm sure many people in Canada will remember this one, the Ebola virus. In Africa, and I want also to mention, kind of, you know, for those of you who might remember the 80s and might be dating myself,、uh, AIDS. I mean, what happened during that situation? We're also going to look at, you know, terrorist attacks, because again, group ends up being stigmatized. So we're talking, for example, what happened on Yonge Street back in 2018,、uh, what happened in Nice in France in 2016 when a guy drove a dump truck in the in the crowd. Uh, for the、uh, national celebration, the the bombing of the、uh, nightclub in Paris in 2015, and obviously 9/11. So, in all these situations, well, you have an event that takes the world stage essentially becomes goes center stage in the world, and a group of people is associated with that event. And people react, generally speaking, fundamentally with fear.、Uh, that fear is very natural. I mean, obviously, we're all programmed, you know, biologically to defend ourselves, prevent ourselves from being hurt or our, our、uh, well-being from、uh, being negatively impacted. So we try, we we react with that fear, and that fear leads us to act or 
not. And this is where the, the key part, one critical element. This question of thinking fast versus thinking slow, reacting based on emotions versus logic, like rational uh, uh, thinking. So we're going to talk about that one. And this is a critical element. The fear drives us to react very quickly. I mean, fundamentally, it was programmed in us biologically, you know, like uh, some some kind of animal, like a you know, tiger shows up uh, not too far. We are afraid, and that's what keeps us alive. So it's, it's natural. The thing is, today, the number of situations where we are in you know, life or death situations where instant reaction is necessary is fortunately not nearly as common as the situations where we were, you know, like say 200,000 years ago in the steppe or someplace like that. So, and the part of that fear is stigmatization of a group. This concept is really not new. I mean, if you think of the, the phrase Cape Goat, where does that come from? Well, it actually comes from the Greeks back 2,500, 2,800 years ago. Yeah. The Greeks came up with a concept. So the idea it was literally a, uh, so it was a male goat. That goat was considered as kind of, they would blame all the problems onto that goat, kill the goat, and the idea was the problems would be gone. So the concept of scapegoat is not exactly new, as you can hear. And it, ha it happens very, very frequently. So in the case of co the coronavirus, obviously, the epidemic started in China. Chinese people end up being st stigmatized. In the case of SARS, the epidemic started in China. Chinese people end up being stigmatized. So the, um, in the case of 9-11, obviously Muslims were stigmatized and that was to happen on a number of occasions since then. In the case of Ebola, people from Africa were stigmatized. Now, in the case of the Ebola virus, the, the virus would, would propagate so quickly that mm, it didn't have kind of the chance of getting out of Africa nearly as much as SARS did, for example. But obviously, that there was stigmatization of people from, of, uh, from Africa. In the case of AIDS, gays were stigmatized. Obviously, the, the, um, the illness I mean, uh, the, the, it was far more prevalent among gay people than it was among others. And so as a result, well, people, gays were stigmatized in the early 80s. And there were lots of jokes about circulating about gays at, around that time. Interestingly enough, Canadians were stigmatized in the United States as a result of both 9-11 and SARS. So in the case of 9-11, there was this uh, misconception that kind of circulated in the US and it took a, I don't know if it has died, but at least it circulated for quite a long time in my experience. So it was the idea that nine, some of the 9-11 attackers, like the, those who kind of uh, hijacked the planes into the World Trade Tower and, uh, and so on, came to the United States through Canada. It was proven that no, they didn't, but that myth or, or misconceptions kept coming back over and over again. I think the most recent example I was able to find on the, on the internet was when McCain, as a, uh, like, even when he was still a, um, how do you call it, a candidate to become president, made that comment. Okay. SARS, well, you know, Canada was, Toronto was quite impacted by SARS, and as a result, Americans didn't want to come and visit Ontario anymore. So this phenomenon is quite common. It is, it is part of our, you know, I guess, human condition or human being. The challenge is, well, knowing that it's there, you know, we can't prevent it from happening, but the question becomes, what do we do about it when it happens? So the, the key part that stigmatize, we need to know, to determine what, is, what does that stigmatization look like? In the simplest form, it's avoidance. You're like, somebody sits next to you in the bus and you move to another seat because that person belongs to the group you want to avoid. You, you, you see somebody who belongs to the group you want to avoid and you change sides, you know, sidewalk you go to, or you turn around in order to avoid crossing that person. Then the, um, the part that I find the most, most insidious is jokes. Essentially, this is where people start kind of 
um, not just doing it at an individual level, but moving into a more collective kind of reaction. Because the jokes, how does the rest of the group respond to the to the jokes? Usually, the jokes are ambiguous, meaning like people can push back, and then the person will say, "Oh, that was just a joke." You can't you take a joke and reaction? But sometimes the joke is far from being neutral or you know uh, harmless. Then you can obviously go into verbal abuse. Uh, and physical violence. In the extreme cases, obviously, if you think of what happened during World War II, uh, the Holocaust, I mean, getting rid of six million Jews and six million of other groups, people of other groups that the Nazis, for, for because of their ideological reasons, thought they're, they're part of the problem. So this happens, unfortunately, like whenever we have a crisis, the question becomes, what do we do about it? We can't prevent it from happening, but that doesn't mean we can let it go, and, and that we should, for, for, for sure. There's a lot of things we can do. So whenever you try to address a social issue, in my experience, you're going, you're going to run into some form of a, 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 bright, a range of responses. Anytime we try to make a change, some people will love the change you are trying to make. So they're enthusiastic, they support you, they're you know, helping you. And you have people who have no intention, they don't like the change you want to make, they resist it, and they try to push back, either actively or passively, but they're kind of trying to avoid that change. And in many cases, in the middle, there would be what I call the silent majority, or I'm not the only one calling it that way. There's a lot of people who don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. They're just kind of, they will go with the flow, if I can, if I, if I can put it that way. And one of the major challenges, whenever we're trying to do things from a social perspective, tackling resistors head on, in my experience, is the most obvious response, but it is usually the least effective. What I mean by that is trying to, ta to, ch to tell resistors to change their mind requires a huge amount of energy for very little effort. Worse than that, in my sense, is that if you try to tackle resistors head on in the presence of other people, then you're far more likely to alienate the silent majority and push them towards the perspective of the resistors as opposed to bringing them to your perspective. So I'll take a very concrete example because I've experienced it personally. Okay? Uh, I'll take the example of racism. Like, like uh, the number of people who will say that racism is a good thing is fortunately very limited. And I, I remember trying to convince my grandfather that racism was not a good idea. So to give you a little bit of context, my grandfather was born in 1920 in France. He is a I admire very much. He's dead now. Uh, he was, so he joined the French Air Force very early on, like it's at the age of 16, he started to learn to fly, and he became a fighter pilot when he was 18. And he won the weapon in 1939, Germany attacked Poland, and he joined the Air Force, and he was the younger fighter pilot in France, probably always will be the younger pilot, fighter pilot in France ever. He had eight victories, uh, he shot down eight planes, during, uh, German, Italian planes during World War II, but he was racist. He was a product of his the era during which France thought that bring you know having colonies in Africa was bringing civilization to them. And I remember it took about five years to make a minute change in his perspective. And so this is why I'm saying. And if you do this in front of others, because I've seen it, like I mean, as a white guy who has attended a number of workshops related to diversity and inclusion, uh, I've seen situations where fundamentally the facilitator is trying to tackle on resistors uh, and, and fundamentally turning the silent majority off. People who have good intentions move away. So what can we do? I really encourage organizations, universities and colleges and, and schools to fundamentally, rather than trying to take on the resistors head on, try to provide information to the supporters, to the people who are the early adopters, and they in turn will bring the silent majority to them, 
and create an environment where it is socially inappropriate for resistors to express their opinions. That, in my, in my experience, is a more effective approach to dealing with these kinds of negative opinions, but negative in my opinion. So concretely, what does it mean? Obviously, if people do things that are clearly cross the line, you know, whether they say or do things that cross the line, that has to be addressed explicitly and immediately, because otherwise, it's like condoning that particular behavior. But if there's no like explicit, you know, something that needs to be addressed explicitly and urgently, then I really encourage you to give the benefit of the doubt to everyone, including those ambiguous perspectives. What do I mean by that? Well, people act out of fear. They're, that saying that you shouldn't be afraid, you shouldn't behave, behave this way, that is not encouraged. They have a reason for that fear. They have a reason for, I mean, uh, rational and emotional. So acknowledging that fear and that that fear is, as is grounded, but helping people see the bigger picture, we'll come back to that point, by giving them information, will enable them to see that their fear is misdirected. Rather than looking at the whole group, a little bit like what Owen was saying, you know, like it's, it's normal to ask people, well, which province did you come from? But don't don't paint because if you come from the province where the where the epicenter of the epidemic is located, obviously that's a higher you have a higher chance of carrying the, the virus. But assuming that everybody who who's Chinese may be carrying the virus, that's probably not that's probably an, uh, over, uh, overly generalizing. So managing learning to ma to manage that fear and. Acknowledging that fear is real, but directing it towards like actual, um, how can I put it, uh, like uh, manageable and practical uh, action step as opposed to blanket steps will be far more productive. When, when you do it that way, I find that people respond positively to, because now you're trying to help them achieve their objective in a way that is more rational and compatible with your own approach. So providing information guidance so people can you know, target their fear more specifically. It is important to, the response of leaders is paramount. In all organizations, the leaders set the tone. I mean, that's universal. And in that respect, if you think of you know, the coronavirus epidemics, Think about what happened in, at Queen's University. I'm sure you've all heard about that coronavirus uh, party that some students threw uh, not too long ago. Clearly, it was bad days. It was, it was not a good idea. And the, uh, the leadership of the university came out very quickly and very strongly against it. The people who organized that party apologized we can move on, but people have clearly learned there was a line here. You could not cross that line. Making things, and, and, and it, it, all these battles, in my experience, are fought in the in public opinion. I think the best example for me, I mean, it was what happened in 2004. Some of you may remember that situation. In Montreal, there was, uh, well, um, somebody tried to set a Jewish library and a Jewish school, I think it was a, like elementary school or kindergarten, on fire, like arson. And fortunately, it didn't work, but there was quite a bit of damage. And Paul Martin, if I remember correctly, was the prime minister at the time. He immediately and uh, went to Montreal. And I, I mean, those are not his words, but essentially he said, this cannot happen, this is not the kind of country we want. And the intensity and speed of the reaction is what communicated the message to everybody that no, this is not the kind of thing we will tolerate in this society. And we haven't had that kind of, uh, um, well, to my knowledge, I can't remember. I mean, there's been, I'm not saying there's no anti-Semitic events taking place in Canada, but I can't recall another library or school being you know, set on fire or attempted to, somebody attempting to set them on fire since then. Contrast that, obviously, with the, what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm sure you all, many of you have seen it. Uh, Trump saying that, well, there were good people on both sides. 
obviously that was the kind of message that Milton people like you know the white supremacist so definitely and, and using words like rapist and criminals for whenever he talks about immigrants does not then does not set kind of example but i certainly wish he was setting one other thing you can think of when you're trying to think about well how are we going to manage situations like these is think about what did canada do during well, after 9 11 and SARS. So 9-11, I'm, sure, I'm assuming some of you may have seen the, uh, the, the, the musical, like, Fun From Away. I mean, it was very clear that Canada contributed significantly to helping the United States in that time of crisis. And so being stigmatized for, like, for things, first of all, that didn't happen and where you being used to kind of shut down the border or like make things hard to go across the people and, and um, goods to go across the American Canadian border was something that people were felt that was really unfair. How did we respond? Same thing with SARS, like people, American tourists would not come anymore. So how did we respond? Well, one big thing was to ex provide information, okay? At the end of SARS, there was a big celebration. I'm sure you're, some of you will remember that uh, concert, like free concert, which is based north of Toronto, if I remember correctly. And there were several premiers serving food to the, to the public. I mean, that event, which made quite a bit of, of um, which got quite a bit of media attention, clearly indicated, okay, this is done. We've got the all clear from health authorities. You can come. And it was definitely the beginning of tour, American tourists coming back to Ontario. So I hope that when the, this, uh, this epidemic is, well, it will, I hope it will end soon, first of all. And, I, and I, I hope that we can all celebrate the end of that epidemic together. Um, one big thing was public relations blitz. Like uh, anytime somebody made a comment about, so what I mean by that is anytime somebody in the American media made a, a negative comment, there were either the, the uh, Canadian amb ambassador in the United States, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or the Prime Minister would immediately kind of comment on that. The, uh, and that public relations blitz. Kind of like every time people said, well, the uh, 9-11 uh, attackers came through Canada, people would immediately say, that is not the case. There is no evidence for that. So in particular, giving that information to uh, opinion leaders. So I remember that the, uh, the well, Canadian politicians at the time would target congressmen, congresswomen. Uh, they would target senators. They would target governor state governors to make sure that these people were aware of the uh well of the actual facts of the case so one important thing is that we need to give the message of the doubt to the people who are trying to stigmatize a community i know it's not easy and there are times where it just you don't feel like it but if you brush away their perspective and say that perspective is not valid, it's not rational, doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes sense to them. My experience is anytime you something that you want to understand their perspective so you can address their concerns and their needs more readily in a way that's compatible with your own approach. So what does it mean concretely? Well, giving the benefit of the doubt is really trying to understand where are, are their fears coming from. If you think of the uh, situation like AIDS, where does the fear coming from? Well, there was a higher incidence of AIDS cases among the, the gay community than the non-gay community. Why is that? Well, this was a question of, of you know how people like safe sex and stuff like that, and also like uh, people drug drug use and stuff. So the, the challenge becomes, well, how do you make sure that people see what the real cause is? It's not being gay that makes you having, have AIDS. It's a particular, like, particular lifestyle. Some gays didn't have it. 
some non-gay ended up having AIDS because of their lifestyle. So it was really a question of how you managed it as opposed to who you were. Same is true when it comes to uh, coronavirus or SARS. Why do, I mean, I, I've heard a number of people say, well, you know, these uh, kind of viruses come from China because they eat anything or they have the, well, why do they eat anything? If you think about it, China has had famines up to fairly recently. I mean, the last famine in China was probably in the late 50s. I mean, and when we're talking famines, we're talking millions of people dying each time. And during a famine, you you eat literally anything you can find. Okay, I mean, in Paris in 1870, there was a famine, and people would eat rats. I mean, that's like rats were for sale. Like at that point, uh, like you, you, people will literally eat anything. Uh, and in and after after a while, some people actually find that while well, they ate something they wouldn't have eaten in normal circumstances, but they actually find they like it. In Middle Ages, in northern Sweden. There was one city that was besieged. I can't remember who was the, the opponents, but in that city, they ended up in a situation where they had pretty much nothing left except some barrels of herrings that are clearly uh, fermented. And they figured, well, we either die, you know, like we're going to be killed by the opponents, or we eat that. So they decided, well, we'll eat it. And some people actually liked it. So that became actually uh, some form of delicacy in northern Sweden. That thing is considered as, uh, um, what's the word? It's unhealthy, even by Swedish uh, health authority, meaning like you cannot legally buy that thing, okay? But people like it. And, you know, it's like this. So what is a delicacy to some people can be very different to other people. So that's, that's, that's one problem. When you have nothing else, will eat anything. So pro providing information perspective really is important for people to see what's going on. And what I mean by that is there's two elements. So what, talk, well, let, me, let me come back to that point. So turning the table, looking at situations where we, ha we are on the receiving end as opposed to the giving end. What I, what is, I mean, I love to use the example of, uh, well, first of all, driver's license, driver, drivers. According to insurance companies, 100% of us think we are above average drivers. Now, if you think about it statistically, that is not possible. But we all think we're better than average drivers. So bullying is a topic that has gotten a lot of attention lately. And nobody enjoys being bullied and we all know we can all remember virtually all people can remember situations where they were bullied but no very few of us remember situations where we were on the bullying side we don't we remember when we are the victim but we don't remember when we are on the let's say perpetrator that sounds too word too strong a word but when we are on the giving side so that's what i mean by turning the table we, what we want to do, or what I encourage people to do, is try to find situations where you were on the receiving end as opposed to the giving end, and integrate both perspectives at the same time as a way to look for a solution. We'll come back to that, finding a solution later. Um, so coming back to the point I just kept, target influ opinion influences. So remember when I talked about Canada and its uh, opinion uh, campaign in the United States, where they targeted uh, people like congressmen, congresswomen, senators, uh, state governors, and so on. That is, so these are people who definitely influence the, the opinion of, you know, of the general American population. Now, at the same time, it is important to recognize that imp opinion influencers are not always the people you expect them to be. And so that is important. If you think of trying to influence students on campus, well, the people who will influence students on campus may not be necessarily the, the obvious choice, like you know, student uh, council or whatever. If you think of the, um, of the United States, one category of people who has a huge impact, and their title wouldn't suggest it that way, are you know shock radio, um, 
radio jockey, like, you know, people like Rush Limbaugh and so on, who have a huge impact on American society, even though it's not obvious or it's not obvious if you look at it from the outside. So targeting opinion influencers is important. How you find them, that can be a bit of a challenge. Another important element in trying to uh, address that fear is to show people the efforts that the populations that are directly impacted, in other words, the groups that are directly impacted and that are most likely to be stigmatized, are making to solve the problem. I mean, for me, the, the, the most extreme example that comes to mind is the healthcare providers in Africa who were treating patients with, who had contracted the Ebola virus. The reason this virus didn't come out of Africa, I think I mentioned it a little earlier, it's like it was so lethal in a sense that if you were infected, the, the chances of you dying were very high and you would die very quickly. What it means, so as a result, it didn't fundamentally, it didn't really have time to get out. Like the people who were infected died before they could get out of Africa. But what it means is for those, the healthcare providers who were taking care of the patients, if they were infected, then their own chances of dying were quite high. And so my, I mean, I really take my hat off to the, all the nurses and doctors who, in Africa who were taking care of these patients, knowing that the odds of them personally dying were quite significant. If you think of the case of China dealing with the coronavirus, I mean, China has implemented uh, measures on a very large scale in order to contain that uh, epidemic and make sure it doesn't get out of China. So let me show you a couple of videos that illustrate this point. There is no sound. Uh, well, don't worry, you won't need it. And we'll just comment as, as we go. So this first video is kind of uh, you know looking at Wuhan, the, the main the the city where the main city where the where the uh, epidemic started from the sky. Like uh, these are drawn pictures. And you can see how big a city it is. I mean, there's a large number of buildings. This is like more than 10 million people. So like we're talking like, you know, the entire greater Toronto area in one city. And I want you to see that. So 50 million people are quarantined in their home. And as you can see, there's, it, there's nobody outside. Just for context, so this is a road three lanes on each side. If in normal circumstances, there would be four cars side by side in each direction and mopeds and, and motorcycles in between. This street at 6 p.m. would be shoulder to shoulder, people all over the place. Okay. Low later, we're going to see a place on the river of the bank, on the bank of the river that goes through Wuhan. And at 6 p.m., that place would, be, would have probably like 500 people, so right here. This place would have 500 people doing Tai Chi or line dancing or any kind of things like, uh, you know, all, all well, enjoying themselves fundamentally. And as you can see, the whole city is completely as a standstill. 50 million people are quarantined. Only one person can go out with the idea that, to go grocery shopping every other day. And people are doing this in order to make sure that other people, it doesn't go outside. The, that comments. So, oops, sorry. Thanks. Let me try to show you the next video. So, I'm sure you've heard about the hospitals, the two hospitals. Actually, China built two hospitals. The first one has a thousand beds. The second one has 1,500. These are hospitals. They were built in like seven to ten days. And so, this is kind of a time lapse of that. Uh, the first one. Now, these hospitals were built in a modular manner, so in order to speed up the process, if you think of building a thousand bed hospital in 10 days, that is quite an, quite an accomplishment. And the reason, the reason is very simple. China, China and Chinese people want to make sure it doesn't Im impact other people. So the, the, they've learned extensively from the SARS experience and you can see that if you go online, you will be able to see the percentage of cases that were, when it comes to SARS, that were in China versus the rest of the world. 
is, is like the Canada in particular had a much higher percentage if you look at the number of cases during SARS, percentage of cases in Canada versus percentage of, well, I mean, total number of cases in, in, in Canada versus total number of, China, of cases in China was a much higher percentage during SARS than it is today. I think we have seven cases and they have 50,000. The ratio was, was much, well, it wasn't one to one, but it was nowhere close to that, to the ratio we have today. So they are really, you know, doing something they don't like to, to help, to help themselves and help the rest of the world, obviously. So, so as I said, <coughs> and I always mentioned, when these situations happen, this dynamics, fear, and then the reaction and so on, this happens all the time. So we know it's going to happen. So how do we prepare for it? Well, number one, one, one thing which I find really helpful is teaching critical thinking and skepticism towards media, particularly media that are where their sources are not exactly unbiased. I find this is a critical element. In graduate studies, you learn that anything you say should be referenced. Like if you're going to, you need to quote a reputable source. I think that that, that principle needs to be applied to any, particularly when people mention facts about things that happen in other parts of the world where people have never been, and so they can't really check. People will say things that are like, well, in my opinion, ridiculous. And when you ask them, well, do you have any source for that? Or did you see it yourself? Or can you be specific? Like, no, they back off. Okay. So it's the principle of like critical thinking. Like, you know, is this really so? Like, you sure? Can you give me an evidence? Is a critical element. Another obvious one is uh, to, okay, to <laughs> emphasize the importance of thinking slowly. What I mean by that is when we make decisions under emotions like quickly, there are times when we have no choice. Okay, we are going to be run over by a truck. We need to get out of the of the road quickly. There's no question about it. But most of the time in everyday life, we have the time. But if we make the decision quickly, we are way more likely to make an sub a suboptimal decision fundamentally. It's not just in case of epidemics or, or terrorist attacks. It's also when it comes to financial, uh, the use of, of money, like how we, what do we do with our money? Uh, there's, um, some of you may have heard of uh, David Shelton. He wrote a book, I think it's the, uh, the Rich Barber or something like that, I can't remember the exact name, but it's about the barber who gives uh, financial advice to his clients. And in, in this book, he talks about a lady who, well, she's realized that she's spending money you know, on impulse buying fundamentally, like, and she's realized that it has impacted her, finance, her financial security quite negatively. So she's decided to change the, her approach. She takes her credit cards, puts them in a big kind of a bowl, you know, pours water on them and put it, puts them into the freezer. So in other words, she cannot access her credit card until the ice has melted. And the ice melting, well, the time it takes to melt, to melt the ice, provides enough of a time buffer that she, the impulse, her impulse to buy something will subside. She, she will have the ability to actually think more rationally do I really need whatever I was thinking of buying at that point? So learning to make sure that we think slowly versus, versus quickly, when do we need to think slowly versus quickly is important. I encourage universities and colleges and, and schools to create committees that, because when, it ha when events like these happen, people will react very quickly based on fear. The only way people who are not afraid can react as quickly is when they are prepared. So let me take the very simple example. A building is on fire. When a building is on fire, most people run away from the building, except firefighters. They run away to the building. Why do they run away to, the, sorry, why do they run to the building when everybody's running away from the building? 
fundamentally, they are prepared. They've received training. They have the right equipment. They have the right procedures. They have an organized. That makes it possible for them to run to the fire as opposed to run away from the fire. So the equivalent is creating some firefighting team. How do we create that? Well, just like firefighters, you know, most of the time, what do they do? Well, they prepare and they rehearse and they have drills. Well, these teams need to do the same thing. Now, what does it mean? Well, we need to discuss what, type, what does stigmatization looks like? What would we do if we had a similar situation to something that happened in the past? Who, which communities might be targeted and so on. And obviously these communities need to, be, to represent a broad range of people, like a broad range of groups within our community so that we can design action plans that will, be, uh, that will truly address the issue. I say this because uh, it's in point to, uh, during the SARS epidemics, I mean, as you know, coronavirus, SARS, one of the big things is, well, good hygiene. So we should wash our hands and, you know, frequently use sanitizers and so on. And so one of the issues that came up during the SARS epidemics was, well, we're going to, like they wanted to, I don't know who, the, the government, I don't know which part, which part of the government was talking about this, was envisioning this. It was the idea of providing sanitizing, uh, sanitizers to communities to make sure that the you know like people would like uh, would not uh, spread the virus, and uh, the the question came, well you know, many of these sanitizing products are alcohol based, and when the, the the discussion came to giving sanitizing product that contain alcohol in them to First Nations, the question that some some let's say uninformed people. Came up, the, came up with the idea, well, maybe they're going to drink it. It's like, well, I'm sure if you had had some First Nations people on that committee, they would have been able to put things in perspective and most importantly, have a discussion as to what would be the most effective approach. So learning to take every community's perspective into consideration to find a solution that works is, in my experience, quite important. So another important element is providing, just like, you know, we, the only thing we can do to prevent, is, well, we can prevent fires, but we also prepare for fires. So you want to create the equivalent of uh, creating an environment that is not conducive to fires, is creating an environment where people know how to manage differences. If you think of when we have forest, what do we do to prevent fires? Well, we try to remove the, under, the uh, underbrush, you know, the, all that dead wood that's on, on the ground. The equivalent here would be to give people training, give people information about other communities, creating links between the communities, creating, helping people feel comfortable fundamentally with differences. That, in my experience, makes a world of difference. It's not easy because we are naturally programmed to, you know, birds of a feather flock together, but it makes a world of difference. And creating connections between communities because it's easy to stigmatize groups you don't know. If you don't know anybody within the group, well, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy target. If you know someone within that group, then it's, you start seeing the group in a different light. You start realizing they're not all the same. So it's much harder to stereotype them, to stigmatize them. You start seeing nuances. You start seeing their perspective. It makes a world of difference. So one of the things I would encourage everyone to do is look at your LinkedIn profile or your Facebook profile. Who are you connected to? What, and more specifically, what percentage of the people you're connected to are like you? Because the more people you're connected to are like you, the less likely you are to get a variety of input. And from a, this is helpful from the perspective of managing these crises, but it's also helpful from a creativity and innovation perspective. What studies have been done to try to understand, you know, what makes people creative and innovative. And they've they found that getting in the richness of input is fundamentally important. So the more different, the, the wider the range of people you're connected to, the wider the range of input you will get, 
and therefore the more informed your perspective will be and the more creative you're likely to be okay so that has benefits from an academic perspective as well so i hope you found this useful so I really encourage you, please ask questions, make comments, okay? I, because I know these are sensitive topics, but I really encourage everyone to ask questions or make comments so we can discuss it together. Thank you very much, Lionel, for this um, very useful presentation, and thank you for everybody who joined us. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, it will be very helpful for us if you could take a minute to fill out the survey. And now I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Melissa, responsible of professional development at CBIE, and she will talk to you about more opportunities uh, regarding intercultural learning. So for those of you who might be interested in pursuing some other professional development uh, activities. We do have our events page. There's a link here right from the, the site, uh, cbie.ca slash events. We currently do, uh, we are offering a course in intercultural uh, foundations and intercultural development. And so if you're interested in that, or if you have any colleagues, it's great to do this course as a team. So if there's two, three of you at your institution that are interested, uh, please reach out to us. Um, or, or register. Uh, this is a, a course taught by SFU, and uh, it's the the outcomes of their this course are really uh, tremendous. And so, uh, check out our website. It's in the events section for more information, and uh, and make sure to reach out to us if you have any questions. We also have our webinar archive where we have a, a list of um, free and um, and uh, w webinars that you that are recorded that you also some of them are free some of them you need to pay for one of which uh, is called uh, developing a culture of uh, safety risk management is everyone's business and so this is very much relevant to today's topic relevant to mental health and mitigating risk and so this is a three-part series that was presented by Alia and it's very good um, and so if, if any of you are, are, are interested in mitigating risk relevant to coronavirus and other potential crises, um, uh, Marie-Claude does go into this in her webinar. And that's, that's it. all I have to say. Yeah, I'll hit, hand it back over to Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you during our next webinar. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you again, Yonel. My pleasure. Thank you.